Um, first of all, I need to apologize because I was told last night that everyone had expected a presentation. Um, that was the plan when we had the venue at IBU, but when we moved to Holsteins, unfortunately, it wasn't really, really amenable um, for a presentation. So uh, what I'm going to do is do the presentation right now, record it for you. So this is what you would have seen last night if there had been a presentation. And then I would welcome folks to post comments or questions in the group um, if any questions come up. So, uh, my name is Amber Scott. I'm going to start with a couple of hefty disclaimers. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. This isn't legal or tax advice. Um, I don't represent any government or government agency. So I know a lot about the way that governments work, um, but nothing that I'm saying is an official position of a government. Um, <clears throat> in fact, this presentation doesn't reflect the official position of any organization, and it doesn't have anyone's pre-approval. Uh, if you have questions about a particular situation, and I guess this one doesn't really apply, but it does apply in terms of questions that are asked in the group. Um, if you have questions about a particular situation or company or person, um, ask me those in private as opposed to in a public forum. And I say that because I've done a fair few presentations where we talk about anti-money laundering and someone's put up their hand and said, oh my god, Mike Smith did this thing and isn't that really suspicious? Um, and should I report that? Maybe, uh, but, le but let's talk about it in a private as opposed to a public forum. So I'm going to give a brief um, and idiosyncratic timeline, which is a history of my own involvement in Bitcoin. Uh, I had first heard about cryptocurrency a little bit before Bitcoin, uh, when there were things like eGold and Liberty Reserve. And what I knew from that perspective, as someone who practiced anti-money laundering compliance, was that folks had gotten themselves into trouble. Um, then I read an article in Wired magazine, and it was pretty flattering about Bitcoin. It was very, very early days. And then a friend and client called me who was doing payment processing at the time. And he was doing payment processing uh, for some financial companies and had started doing processing for a Bitcoin exchange. And he wanted to update his risk assessment. And he said, can you help me do that? I said, sure, no problem. Um, I don't know a lot about Bitcoin and how Bitcoin works. I read about it in Wired. I know these couple of little facts. Um, can you pay my retainer in Bitcoin? Because that's going to let me get my hands on it and play with it. Now, in 2013, there weren't beautiful GUI wallets the way that they are now. Everything that I was dealing with was command line. So on the Thursday, he said, yeah, no problem. I'll pay your retainer in Bitcoin. I'm going to pay it on Monday. You're going to need to figure out wallet and security and everything between now and then. I said, okay, no problem. Um, Thursday night, started working on it. Friday didn't get anything done, but, you know, reading and figuring out around Bitcoin over the course of the weekend canceled all of my plans, sort of got on my husband's nerves a little bit in terms of um, what I was doing in that regard because I was just falling down this this Bitcoin rabbit hole. And on Monday, I got this retainer payment, which for me was this amazing, you know, first peer to peer payment where there were no financial intermediaries and I could see everything recorded on this public blockchain. Uh, no, I didn't keep that retainer money because I felt like I really had to interact with it to understand. There weren't a lot of things that you could buy with Bitcoin at the time either. So I bought it. I, um, one of the things that I bought at the time was a tablet. And it was just the experience of having the payment in Bitcoin, be, you know, being able to see what that looked like in comparison to other payment methods. Um, <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, MT Gox happened, uh, so a lot of folks lost money, um, a lot of pretty negative press then, and some of the headlines were fascinating just in terms of um, Bitcoin has failed and Bitcoin's CEO has been arrested. So a, a lot of, even in those early days, a lot of things that were just patently untrue. Um, from a Canadian perspective in 2014, um, we had some regulation, or, or not regulation, we had a law that passed that said there would be regulation. Um, that year I spoke um, on a panel with CA Vertex and a couple of other folks at Canada's first Bitcoin Expo. Um, this was a fascinating experience because it, it was a lot of fun to be at the Expo. Um, and someone spent um, enough time to write an entire article about why a compliance person was there in the first place and how I must have been some sort of mole from some sort of federal agency. Um, in Canada, 
uh, it's different from the U.S. So in Canada, a lot of the compliance that people are doing is voluntary. So the banks are acting as de facto regulators and saying you have to have an anti-money laundering program in place and the exchanges are putting it in place. In the U.S., it's a different situation. Um, Bitcoin exchanges are required to register as money transfer organizations. Um, they're required to register with FinCEN uh, and they are required to do state-by-state -state registrations for the states that they're dealing in. Um, the U.S. isn't my primary practice, but we do have a U.S. partner who's Colleen and she's phenomenal. So if you have questions about that type of business, um, she can definitely answer those for you. Uh, and the last bullet point that I had on here is convictions and communities. Um, one of the wonderful people that I've gotten to know a little bit over the years is Charlie Shrem. Uh, and Charlie Shrem, of course, um, you know, did get himself into some trouble, um, did spend some time in prison. And I think he's always been, to my mind, one of the most fascinating personalities in the Bitcoin world. He's brilliant. He's very candid. And one of the things that I like is the type of advice that he gives the community in terms of making sure that folks are protecting themselves, making sure that folks are, are protecting their businesses um, and not being vulnerable to the types of mistakes that he made. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we have a little bit of tension between technology and regulation. And I think this is important because there's a fair, you know, a fair bit of um, misinformation in the Bitcoin community about what regulation is, what regulation you have to follow. Uh, we'll cover a few of those misconceptions today. But I think the main tension between these two things is that technology is fast um, and it's everywhere. So it's, it's instant and it's universal. I can deploy an application on the internet and it's everywhere in the world all at once. Regulation is slow, so it doesn't change quickly. There's a whole process that needs to be followed and it's local. So following the regulation in one place doesn't necessarily mean that you're compliant in somewhere else. Um, in fact, if you don't do the research to figure out if you are or not, there's a good chance that you might not be. So I'm gonna run through a few examples of, of fact versus fiction. And what I've tried to do with these examples uh, is to keep them as Bitcoin-centric as possible and as America-centric as possible. And these are all based on things that I've heard from folks within the last few weeks. Um, one of the things I've heard is that um, all Bitcoin activity, so all Bitcoin activity, is highly regulated. And while there is definitely regulation that applies to Bitcoin, uh, for the most part, this isn't new regulation. These aren't new laws. So the money transfer laws for businesses that transfer monies, those already existed. Uh, FinCEN as a regulator already existed. With the exception of New York BitLicense um, and, and a couple of other things that are being considered right now, there really aren't a whole lot of new laws that were written to say, this is Bitcoin and we're going to regulate it differently, we're going to treat it differently. And that's pretty important to remember. Uh, because what I mean by that is that if you weren't a criminal before you touched Bitcoin, you're not a criminal now. Um, and those, those are, I think, important because people are very worried about that in some regards. Um, there's also the sense that if you're incorporated in the USA, you don't need to worry about laws in other jurisdictions. Now, this is true. I'm not picking on the USA. Um, this is true no matter where you are. So we definitely have companies that are from outside of Canada. They're just surprised to learn we have different laws that they have to follow in Canada. And I've definitely worked with Canadian companies that said, but I'm, I'm following the law in Canada. Why do I have to do different things for America? And this is part of that regulation being slow and local. Um, any of those jurisdictions, if you're doing business, uh, you have to think about where your customers are and what laws apply to the place where your customers are. This is why you see certain companies that, that simply don't do business in certain jurisdictions or even within the USA, and I think Shapeshift is a really fascinating example. Shapeshift serves most of the states. Um, they don't serve New York. They don't deal with bit license. And so you see these exoduses in some cases from places where the, the regulations are particularly onerous. Um, and why does it matter where you incorporate? This is probably the number one question, or, or at least one of the number one questions that we get from folks that are looking to do some type of startup um, in the Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency world. Um, incorporating outside of the USA doesn't mean that you have to follow American law if you are serving American customers. 
Um, if there's one thing that you take away from what I'm saying today, um, and, and you're thinking of doing a business in the Bitcoin world, and you're thinking of serving customers in America, this is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say. Um, if you're serving people in America, you really need to consider American law. Um, your, the government does not have a whole sense of humor about how you treat people and their money. Um, and those laws tend to be existing laws. One of the things that we hear fairly often, um, and I've, I've been guilty of being caught up in some of the sensationalism myself, is that people are going to jail because they're buying and selling Bitcoins on local Bitcoins. And like a lot of things, there's a grain of truth to this. This came from somewhere. And where this generally came from, at least in my opinion, is that there have been arrests. Um, local Bitcoins have been mentioned. People have been charged with running an unlicensed money transfer operation. And those have generally been instances where the person was already being pursued for something else. Um, so let's say that I'm already running a money laundering operation or I'm trafficking people or guns or any illegal thing that you want. Um, so I'm already doing illegal activity and beyond that, I'm getting paid in Bitcoin. I'm taking that Bitcoin and I'm selling it on local Bitcoins, um, trying to get cash, trying to get other methods of payment. Um, if that's happening and the police are already investigating me, when they charge me, they're going to throw other charges on top of that. And this is where those charges of operating an unlicensed money remittance business and things like that come in. If I'm just a, you know, I'm just me and I mined a couple of Bitcoins back in 2013 um, and now I'm going to take some profits and I, you know, I'm going to go and sell a couple of those on, on local Bitcoins to some local folks um, who just want to buy, you know, maybe $100, maybe $1,000 worth of Bitcoin here and there. I can do that. And that's not a problem. Um, I am very unlikely to deal with, with any um, issues with the law because of that. But if there's something uh, that you're doing anyway and there, there's an investigation that's happening into that, um, there's definitely a possibility that they will look at that and try to say, okay, is this an unlicensed money remittance business? Was there an actual business model that was happening as opposed to just being a person that was selling something online? Um, and if there is, that's an additional charge that will be added to the pile of charges. Um, the last one is we've been hearing a lot that there are some new requirements um, there aren't. They require people uh, to declare Bitcoin at the border just like you would cash. So generally speaking, Bitcoin isn't considered currency. And at the border, when they're talking about cash, what they mean is physical cash, so notes, coins, things like that. Um, if you have Bitcoin, you're not required to declare it in the same way. However, I do want you to think about where you're traveling to um, and what you have on your devices. Because you might be asked to open your laptop. You might be asked to unlock your laptop. Uh, you might be asked to provide access to things. And I am not saying that um, necessarily there is always corruption, but there is sometimes corruption. And so if you're traveling to somewhere that has a fair bit of corruption, if you are concerned about corruption, if you are concerned about operational security, I would really consider what it is you have on your laptop or on your phone at the time that you travel. Uh, because one of the beautiful things about having complete financial sovereignty um, and complete financial responsibility and holding your own keys and, and being responsible for your own Bitcoin wallets is that you're completely responsible for your own Bitcoin wallets. Um, and so if you ever deal with a situation where a corrupt official decides that now they're, they're in your laptop and they might send some Bitcoin to themselves and they have access to do that, um, that's problematic and that becomes very hard to recover. And in situations like that, um, you're probably in a foreign country, you probably have very little recourse. Uh, so really think about what you have, um, about what's displayed and what you're bringing. And I would say that this is true just from a, a data sanit sanitization perspective and operational security perspective generally when you travel. 
Um, I don't worry an awful lot going between Canada and the U.S., um, but I've certainly traveled to places where I, I have had little to no information on the devices that I traveled with, and that was a deliberate choice. So do keep that in mind. Um, do keep in mind that you are ultimately responsible for your security and the security of your Bitcoin. And I'm going to leave it off there. Um, there's my contact information. Feel free to post comments and questions in the group. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get to give a formal presentation while I was here uh, with all of you, but we should be back in 2018, myself and hopefully my colleague Rodney, uh, who's in one of the groups as well. So hopefully we will talk to you then. Thank you so much, Portland. You have been terrific. Cheers.